excited about the thing that the God of the Bible has given the Lord's church for 2020, God's truth. And I love it because it flies in the face of what has become popular today. We live in a day where there are many so-called truths. Uh, there is a damnable uh, manner of speaking that has crept into the world, and you even see it into the church, people using uh, express, expressions and phrases that no believer should use. And that is when, we, when we're talking to each other and we claim to have our own individual truth. Well, that's your truth, and I'll tell my truth, and you can tell your truth. I stand before you today, saints, to tell my truth. No, 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 no. No, that, that's, that is not, number one, that's not proper. And number two is not true. And I'm going to show you why in just a moment. See, that's, that's, and, and, and that came from the pit of hell because it's designed to give the idea that there is more than one truth. Many things can be true, but from a religious ideological standpoint, in the overall view of things, there is only one truth. Oh, I'm going to talk to you. You may not say amen, but I'm going to talk to you. Amen. There is such a thing as overarching truth. We talked about this years ago. It's amazing how God keeps us ahead of what's going on. Gessler and Brooks, in their book, When Skeptics Ask, what, if, there's, if there's ever been a, a book that I recommend that you buy, uh, 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 second to the Bible, I'd recommend When Skeptics Ask. He said this in dealing with the conversation that Pilate had with our Lord. John's Gospel, chapter 18 and verse 38. Pilate asked of all people, Jesus. He asked him, what is truth? Pilate's words rang with the cynicism of a man who searched for it but never found it. His implication when he asked Jesus what is truth, his implication is that there is no such thing. Pilate is not alone. Many have followed the same road so that what is taught in the schools is the same cynical conclusion that Pilate came to, and that is that there is no truth or no such thing as truth. And one of the ways that you attack the notion of truth and you convince people that there's no such thing as truth, uh, is that you give everybody their own truth. See, because if everyone has their own truth, that makes no sense because then if everyone has their own truth, then there's no such thing as the truth. You have yours and I have mine. She has his, and he has hers. And if everybody's truth is truth, then no one's truth is truth. It is true that everyone is welcome to have their own opinion. You can have your opinion, and, and you do. And I have mine. But you can't have your own truth. If words still have meaning, you can't have your own truth. And see, part of the, 
part of it. Remember now, you have to remember, uh, and, and everything I preach, I, I'm preaching from a biblical context. You remember, the, 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 the thing that the Antichrist will do, the, the, one of the major characteristics of him is that he is a liar. He's, the, the world is being conditioned for the big lie. We're fed lies to get us conditioned for the big lie. The big lie will be when the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and declare himself as God, this Antichrist. He is as much a religious figure as he is a political figure. This is why as a minister and as a ministry and as a church, we keep our hands in both. If you, if you abandon what's going on in politics altogether, then you miss 50% of what the devil is doing, of how he's, how he's attacking. Because when you study the scriptures and you study the Antichrist, it's hard to determine whether he will be a religious figure or a political figure. The truth is, he will be both. And he uses both. Praise the Lord. So you have to, as a believer, you, we cannot practice abandonment theology and just point at the world and say, that's the world. We'll have nothing to do with that. We won't vote. We won't participate. We won't arm ourselves with the facts. We won't find out what politicians stand for. We just vote. I just vote according to a certain party or I just vote based on the way I was told to vote or I, I, just, uh, I just walk in lockstep with what someone else tells me. No, you got you to gotta be involved. And, I, and I'm sorry, uh, it, it, you, you can't be lazy and be involved. I told some preachers or friends of mine who were, uh, who carried a mantle as prophets and prophetesses and people like that, I said, listen, your mantle is too strong for you to be lazy. You have to put the time in. You have to pay attention. You have to study. You know what it requires? It requires that you be less social. It requires that people not be able to reach you on the phone all the time because you got to spend a certain amount of time alone with God and a certain amount of time paying attention to what's going on. Jesus told us to watch and pray. Paul says that we're to be sober. And he warned us not to sleep in the night. You have to pay attention. Are you with me? Truth, the word truth, the, uh, the Greek word for the, our English word truth, the word is aletheia. There's no reason why you would probably remember that word. But a, 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 a clear definition of aletheia is reality clearly lying before your eyes. <laughs> Opposite. Uh, opposed to a mere appearance. Reality, clearly lying before your eyes, opposed to a mere appearance. You know, there are those today who are asking us to bend our minds uh, to deny reality and to call a man a woman and a woman, a man. Do you know what you got to do to your, to your psyche? Do you know what you got to do to yourself to be able to do that? You have become, you will become the worst of the worst. You are a reality denier. That's a good one. A reality denier. You look at reality because someone prefers to be uh, referred to a certain way, even though reality may say that they're not that way. And we bend 
reality. I'll give you a, a benign, a harmless example of this. And people mean no harm, and I don't want to make any enemies. But just think about it. Okay? I throw things out to just make people think. I'm always fascinated when I hear people who are happily married and got a good family and, and they reference their daughter-in-law or their son-in-law as, as uh, you have heard people say of their son-in-law, well, he's not my son-in-law, uh, he's my son. I dropped the in-law. But that sounds so nice and people mean no harm. Only, only problem is though, if that, if that is really the case, which, that, which is not, Alethea, that's not reality. But what you're actually uh, endorsing, though, is bestiality. Not bestiality, incest. Because he's married to your daughter. Now, I have a tremendous son-in-law. But John is not my son. John is Crystal's husband. Crystal wouldn't have married her brother. And her brother wouldn't have married her. Am I right? No, 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 no. And neither would be sitting up in here serving in this church. In incest. Words have meaning. Some people say oh, there's no such thing as legitimate or illegitimate children. I understand that, that sentiment. It's emotional. But if words have meaning, if you follow that logic to its, that to its logical conclusion, it also means that marriage means nothing. Because the Bible says that the children that are born of a marriage are legitimate. King James says holy. Not holy as in sinless, but legitimate. Now all human beings are human beings. And you, you can take what I'm saying, you can receive it, because I was born out of wedlock. So I'm not putting anybody down, because I, I, you know uh, I, I'm not, I, I'll never be accused of putting me down. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm glad that I was born. I'm glad my mother gave birth to me. I'm glad. I'm glad. I enjoy breathing. Praise the Lord. I try to eat right, work out, and do everything I can to stay here for as long as possible. So that's not my point. But my point is that words have meaning. And there is such a thing as truth. There is such a thing as reality. Aletheia is unveiled reality lying at the base and agreeing with an appearance. If it looks like an onion and you get close enough and you peel it back or you taste it or you smell it and it is actually an onion, then that's truth. That's aletheia. But if from a distance it looked like an onion and you got close enough and you found that it, that it was a, a big uh, plum, and when you touch the texture, the, the reddish, you know, there's some, on some onions are reddish in color, you find out it was a, a plum then you no longer, if you have sense, call it an onion. Am I right? Aletheia manifested or veritable essence of matter. It is the veritable, that is the actual essence of a thing. What a thing actually is. Reality pertaining to an appearance. The Bible says, neither let your good be evil spoken of. The reality pertaining to an appearance. Sometimes a thing may appear to be one way when it's actually another. Aletheia is the reality pertaining to an appearance. If, if the appearance is one thing and the reality is another, then it's what reality say it is and not what its appearance says it is. Does that make sense? For the Christian, the view that there is no truth, no such thing as truth, overarching truth, is not an option. Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. And in our text, verse 17, the B clause, Jesus said this about the Bible. Thy word is truth. There is truth. But what is the nature, follow me, of truth? More important, how can we know truth? John MacArthur gives one of the best answers as to what truth is and why truth is so important. He said this, considering who stood before him, speaking of Pilate in the same text, he said the gravity uh, and the gravity of the issue, Pilate was uh, trying to decide, he says Pilate's attitude was astonish, astonishingly dismissive. Because truth was standing in front of him when he asked Jesus, what is truth? But he did raise a vital question. What is truth? Where, after all, does this concept come from? Why is it so basic to all human thought? Here's the answer. Every idea we have, every relationship we cultivate, Every belief we cherish, every fact we know, every argument we make, every conversation we engage in, and every thought we think presupposes that there is such a thing as truth. The idea is an essential concept without which human, the human mind could not function. If there is no such a thing as truth, our minds shut down. Because everything we do re rely on there being such a thing as truth. So then, what is truth? Here is an example, a definition drawn from the Bible, from what the Bible teaches about truth. And if you're writing this down, write it down. Truth is, if you're taking notes, write this down, excuse me. <laughs> truth is that which consists, which is consistent. Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, the will, the character, the glory, and the being of the God of the Bible. Even more to the point, Truth is the self-expression of the God of the Bible. That is the biblical meaning of truth. Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, the will, character, glory, and being of the God of the Bible. Even more to the point, truth is the self-expression of the God of the the Bible. Let me tell you college students something. You don't, you don't go to the college campus and sit in class and get exposed to new ideologies and new ideas and all of a sudden you come back home and you're sitting in front of your mom and dad saying, well, I'm not quite sure about the Bible anymore. Well, that's, 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 that, that behavior is not new. It's for the simple. It's for those who have no depth. And see, the church has got to defend God's truth because those who are trying to turn us from God's truth are very good at what they do. Oh, my, all she got to do is just have a program and give away a few cars. Nothing like getting a free car to change your religion. <laughs> Boy, it's amazing. It's amazing how what we sell out for. Amen. See, and, and here's when you know the devil feels like he's got it. Because I have said for 20 years that her show is a religious service. You rolled your eyes at me. And some stopped coming back. Other family members got frustrated. Extended family. 
How do you know? I love Oprah. I do too. I enjoy her show. So, so did I, some of them. But, it, but I also saw what was going on. They are peddling a religion. Even these shows, uh, judge this one, judge that one, watch the shows, there's a religion that they're promoting. There is a moral, there is a godlessness, godless, that is secular, unholy, no God. They offer solutions without God. Dr. Phil's whole show and others like him it, it offers solutions without Bible. We're going to fix your marriage without scripture. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fix your head without scripture. We're going to tell you why you let them inject concrete saline in your buttocks to get a bigger butt. We're going to tell you what's wrong with you to do something that stupid without scripture. And so people in the church all of a sudden, here we come trying to offer scriptureless solutions. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a preacher. I have one, my medicine is from Genesis to Revelation. You notice, even in my preaching style, I don't go too many minutes, if that, in a sermon without saying the Bible says. The Bible says. Why? Because we're told in Scripture to preach the Word. Let me move on. Truth is also ontological, which is a fancy way of saying that it, uh, that it is the way things are. Amen. Reality is what it is because God declares it so and made it so. Therefore, God, the God of the Bible, is the author, the source, Oprah, the source, the determiner, the governor, the arbiter, the ultimate standard, and the final judge of all truth. I wish I could talk to Dwayne Wade. I would tell him, man, stop calling your son a little girl. The truth is, that's a little boy. Now, I don't care how tall you are. Doesn't matter to me how many NBA championships you won, how well you can dribble the ball. Doesn't matter who you're married to. All those things have no effect on truth at all. None. This is why, as a believer, you can be intimidated by nobody. Oh, well, this person's a millionaire. This person's a billionaire. This person is rich. This person is famous. Makes no difference. They're all people. When the fires broke out in California, of all people riding around with his family in his automobile trying to find a hotel room, to check in, to get away from the fire, was the mighty LeBron James, arguably the best basketball player to ever live. But notice this. He's subject to the same elements, same emotions, same fire, and same hotel vacancy as everyone else. It's amazing. It's amazing. At the end of the day, we're all the same. And God's truth, praise the Lord. No one is above God's truth. No one is above reality. The Bible says God is a spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit with the proper attitude and in truth, in reality, in the real world. Man, I'm glad that this thing works in reality. Oh, I won't finish this today, but the Old Testament refers to Abraham, it refers to the Almighty God as the God of truth. Deuteronomy 32 and 4 says, He is the rock. He is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. That's Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. Psalms 31 and verse 5, the last clause says, 
O Lord God of truth. You find in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 16, says that he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. According to Hebrews in the Old Testament now, in the New Testament, excuse me, uh, chapter 1 and verse 3, speaking of Jesus, the Hebrew writer said this about our Lord, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, the Hebrew writer declared that Jesus Christ is truth, God's truth incarnate. Bible says in John's gospel chapter 1 and verse 14, and the word was made flesh. Incarnate means to come in the flesh. Jesus was the walking embodiment of God's truth. The word was made flesh, the Bible says, and dwelt among us. He is the perfect expression of God and therefore the absolute embodiment of all that is true is Jesus Christ. Yes, of all people, Jesus Christ. Oprah outgrew him. But Jesus Christ is the embodiment of all that is true. According to our text, the Father, God the Father, has given Jesus authority to give eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. I'm preaching about eternal life, but I need to talk to you about God's truth. Jesus said this in our text, chapter 17, verse 2, the A clause, thou hast given him power over all flesh. That is authority over all mankind. In verse 3, we are told what eternal life is. And in our teachings, our last teachings Thursday night, we were also told what eternal life is not. We're told in verse 3 that eternal life is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. To know him opposed, opposed to idols. But we also said Thursday night and uh, I saw eyebrows raised that eternal life is not simply living forever. Eternal life is not simply living forever. Living forever includes eternal life, but eternal life is more than living forever. Mother, here and elsewhere, it's more than existing forever because there is a region that you don't want to exist forever in if you don't have eternal life. Y'all hear me. I'm telling you something. I know where I'm headed. It is not simply living forever. There's more to it than that. The point that we're making is the fact that we who exist and all who in the past existed, we who were formed in the womb, we who were allowed to be born, those who were conceived in the womb but were never allowed to be born will still exist forever somewhere. I need you to hear me. All who were ever born, all who were ever conceived, all who ever live past, present, and future will always and forever exist. That is not the definition of eternal life, even though that is living forever. 
I want to show you something. Case in point. Life starts, all life, with God. Genesis 2 and 7 says, and, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. And all he had then was a mannequin, a dummy. Then something happened. Something happened that didn't come from the time realm. Something happened that didn't come from the earth realm. Something happened that didn't come from anything that could ever be, that could ever die. The Bible says, and God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. The breath of life comes from God. All life comes from God. All, also, human life does not merely, uh, and I know I'm walking on thin ice, began at conception. Well, where does it begin then, preacher? It began in the mind of God. God said to Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 4 through 5, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before, before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God says before I allowed your mama and your daddy to come together, I knew thee. This is another reason why abortion is such a damnable thing. Preacher said from Atlanta the other day that he wanted to set the pro-life people straight. He called pro-life people those who are making women uh, give birth to children. You don't have to make a woman, a pregnant woman, give birth. All you, gotta do, all you gotta do is let her. God has already set that in motion. By definition, an abortion is a man-made interference. It's an artificial man-made interference. Man cutting off something that would naturally take place. So the interferers are the other side, not us. You just leave her alone, she'll have the baby. You don't hear me. God formed Jeremiah. We see that God even sanctified him and God gave him purpose before he entered into his mother's womb. David said this about his existence. He said, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are, are thy works and that my soul know right well. He says of himself when he was in his mother's womb, my substance was hid from, was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, I'm not even developed all the way yet, and in thy book all my members, all my body parts were written, which in continuance were fashioned, and listen to this, when as yet there was none of them. Psalms 139, verse 14 through 15. Did you hear what, was, what I said in the, in the last clause of verse 16? When as yet there was none of them. That is, before I had one day on the earth. Before I was placed in my mom's womb. Before I was born, God had given me plan. And God had given me purpose. David said this about the Lord's work, 139 verse 17, how precious are thy thoughts unto me. Oh God, how great is the sum of them. So since life come from God, are you following me? I know by now I'd be hooping. And uh, 
Now, this human body that we live in is temporary. Then what happens to the breath of life when we die? According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 16, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, shall not go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now concerning where this breath of life go when we die, the question has to be when you read this text, if we are not going to go before them which are asleep, a thinking person says, asleep where? And if the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then arise from where? Because it clearly says they're asleep. But asleep where? Glory to God. Because my argument is that the human spirit lives forever. But my point I'm trying to show you is that eternal life is more than existing forever. For the Bible even teaches that the day will come when men shall seek death and death shall flee from them. Oh my. Matter of fact, I contend that you don't want to live forever without God. But I also contend that you will live forever. You will exist forever without Jesus. Even if you don't get saved. But it won't be in existence that you would want. Uh, we're starting the new year off right. Going to the heart of the matter. The Bible speaks of a place. Theologians know this and serious Bible students know. Of a place that is the region of the conscious, departed, disembodied spirits. There's a region. There's a place where all who have received the breath of life go after you die. For the believer, it is a place of conscious blessedness. You hear that? Conscious blessedness awaiting, glory to God, the resurrection and the glorification of the body. Waiting for Jesus to come back and get us. I just read where Paul says that uh, he's going to come back for those who are asleep. So I'm asking, asleep where? Praise the Lord. There's a place where all of the believers go. Thank you. We call it heaven, but there's a place uh, where all belie believers go. Did I, did I tell you? Conscious. That is, they're blessed and they know it. They know each other. They're awaiting the resurrection and waiting for their glorified bodies. See, they hadn't got the bodies yet. Glory to God. Paul said the day is coming when this mortal shall put on immortality and this corruption shall put on incorruption. And then Paul said, and we shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. But, but the believers who are dead now, uh, they're waiting. Sleeping. In a beautiful place where uh, they're just waiting for Jesus to come back and get them. Yes, this place is a beautiful place. For the believer, <clears throat> for the unbeliever, it is a place of conscious 
Did I say conscious? Conscious torment. Waiting. They're tormented. Waiting for the final judgment. Whether they are believers or unbelievers, neither have ceased to exist. Even though they're dead and gone, they have not ceased to exist. The breath of life that God breathed in you and in me cannot be annihilated. It cannot be exterminated. It cannot be brought into extinction. It didn't come from the earth realm. It came from the eternal God. Hallelujah. This is why when people say, my life is my own, says who? When was the last time you breathed into your nostrils the breath of life? The, the, the Bible tells us that our lives is, is his. The Bible says we were created for his pleasure. We were created for him and by him. So now, you out there who are living your life the way you want to live it, doing what you want to do, living how you want to live, it's not yours. And if you don't do right with it, when you die, we'll have your funeral here. And maybe the preacher might lie and say you're in a better place. But uh, there is a region. I read the Bible. There is a region where the dead go and the dead are conscious. What's the name of that place, preacher? What's the name of that place, preacher? What's the name of that place, preacher? The name of that place is Hades. Bible says in Revelations 20 and 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and, King James says, hell. Death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Revelations 20 and 13. Notice death in Revelations verse, chapter 20, verse 13. This word death here means spiritually, spiritual death, and physical death. So, some of the people who will be in, everybody in Hades died. But some died two times. They were dead physically, and they were dead spiritually, and they are tormented in the flame. Others died one time. Praise the Lord. They got saved. Jesus said, he that believeth in me, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He wasn't saying that they'll never have your funeral, but what he was saying was, you'll never taste of the second death. You will always cease. You will always exist and you'll be glad of it. <laughs> Glory to God. There are people there who died physically in that they shed this natural sin-cursed body. This old building keeps on leaning. I've got to move to a better home, but there's a home for the believer. Did I say that they were conscious? In there, enjoying the goodness of the Lord. Now, where is that in the Bible? I hear you. Uh -huh, Luke, the chapter 16, and uh, verse 19. Y'all hear that country coming out of me? Uh, 
Don't pray it out of me here. Let me keep that. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared scrumptuously every day. I love to read this to Oprah. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the rich man's gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And to add insult to injury, to make it worse, moreover, the dogs came and licked his souls. I wonder what would the Word of Faith movement have to say about this man? Since at the heart of their teaching is they want all us to believe that God wants us all to be millionaires and God wants us all to be rich. Well, here's a man who never got rich. Matter of fact, his situation on this planet didn't improve. And to add in such insult to injuries, the dogs licked his souls. But I'll tell you something. Time passed and the inevitable took place. And it came to pass that the beggar died. Oh Lord, and was carried by, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Yes, and the rich man also died. Death is the great equalizer. Rich or poor, everybody dies. You know. Many billionaires are trying to invest in all kinds of things to, this, this, to, to keep them alive forever. You're going to die. Everybody's dying. Everybody. Praise the Lord. Yes, the rich man died. It's cryogenics. You're going to die. You freeze, you freeze whatever you want to. You're going to die. He died. Yes, sir. And uh, it said the poor man was carried to Abraham's bosom. But it says the rich man was buried. Now what we know is both men died. And in hell, he lifted up, the rich man here, he lifted up his eyes. He was in Hades being tormented. In the flame. Are you praying for me? Amen. Uh, amen every six months would be all right. <laughs> Glory to God. Say he died and uh, he lifted up his eyes. He was there and he was tormented in the flame. In the flame. Hades is the same word. Hell is the same a Greek word. From Revelations, it's Hades. And uh, he was conscious because he was tormented and he knew it. And then, and, and see if afar off he could see, he saw Abraham. He was conscious, he knew people. He recognized Abraham. Abraham wasn't walking around with a sign on saying, my name is Abraham. The man knew Abraham. He saw Abraham from a distance. And guess who else he saw? He saw that old beggar. Man who soars the dog licked. Saw him in the bosom of Abraham. Uh, they were in a place where both could see each other. They were in a place where, praise the Lord, they could communicate without a PA system. It gives you an idea of the distance. They couldn't have been 10 or 15 miles apart. For they talked to each other. The Bible is clear on this. And he cried, he screamed. Yes, 
He screamed and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Didn't sound too rich then. And then here's a little classism, a little classism, he didn't get it. And send uh, Lazarus. Sound like what uh, Clinton said when President Obama was running the first time against Hillary. He said down in South Carolina a few years ago, this guy would have been bringing us coffee. Oh, he said it. He did say it. Oh, Lord. And uh, he said, send Lazarus. Let him wait on me. He ain't nobody. Send Lazarus that he may dip his, uh, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He's aware of his suffering. Then I heard him say, for I am tormented in this flame. Please send me. I'm hiding. Hey, still alive. Still existing. Dead and buried. Still in existence. Not annihilated. Not wiped off the face of the map. Wiped off the face of the earth. But there's another place. See, when you leave here, they had some funerals yesterday. Uh huh. But when you leave here, you don't go, praise the Lord. Uh, somebody say you're in a better place. That depends. I know we're living in a day now where everybody goes to heaven, but I'm here to tell you, that depends. I'm not going to shake your neighbor's hand too much flu. Just wave your hand and say, that depends. Uh-huh. And I heard Abraham said, Abraham said to him, in verse 25, I feel my help. Abraham said, son, son. Yes, love, son. Remember. Now that tells you right there, on the other side, your mind still works. That tells you right there, on the other side, you'll remember this side. Tells you, tells you, he, 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 he said, remember uh, that uh, doing thy, thou doing thy lifetime. When you were living, you received this, received this, uh, uh, thy good things. You had it made. Mm -hmm. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But I heard him say, in that other region, in that other region, beyond this world, I heard him say, but now. See, that's still a now. When you die and leave here, that will still be a now. There's a place, there's a realm. And I heard him say, but now he is comforted. And thou art tormented. And then I heard him say this, because they're in the same place. He says, and beside all this, beside all this, between us, there is a great gulf. And I heard him say, and it's fixed. Somebody shout fixed. It's a permanent gulf. There is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass uh, from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Same place, a gulf on one side, bosom of Abraham. God it made. Good time. These are the good times. Leave your cares behind. But on the other side, torment, trouble, fire, no joy in trouble. 
uh, the region of the departed spirits of both the lost and the saved is called Hades. Are you praying for me? Jesus spoke of Hades four times in the Gospels. Bible said in Matthew 11 and 23, I want to preach, but I got to teach. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus speaks of the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The death of Hades, people dying, will not prevail against the church. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, and verse 15, he says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, you shall be brought down to Hades. Oh, Lord. And then in Luke 16 and 23, he says, And, and in Hades, uh, he lifted up his eyes, being tormented in the flame. But I feel the fire burning. For there is another place. Hallelujah. That Jesus spoke of. Uh-huh. That's also translated in the King James. That's called hell. It's translated the same word hell. But it's a different place altogether. If you read in your word, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 5, verse 29 and 30, you read what Jesus said, if your right eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body be cast into hell. But this word hell here is not the Greek word Hades, but it's hell Gehenna. It is hell, the place of everlasting torment. Good God Almighty, he said in verse 30, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and pluck it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish then for your whole body to be cast into Gehenna. And then I heard him say in Matthew 10 and 28, you Bible students out there, he said, fear not them which can kill the body but, have, but are not able to destroy the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy the soul and the body in Gehenna. Uh -huh. Hell, Gehenna, not Hades. Matthew 23 and 15 says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass seas and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold. The children of Gehenna, then yourselves. Gehenna, hell, is the place or the state of the, the law of the laws where they're condemned forever. Can I get a witness? Oh, I hear you quiet out there. But go on and follow along. If you read Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 9, if we start at verse uh, 44, Jesus spoke of a place. He said, uh, where the worms dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, he said, cut it off, for it is better for thee to enter halt into life than to have two feet and be cast into Gehenna where the fire is never quenched. Good God Almighty, do you see that? And he says, where the worms die if not, and the fire is never quenched. What is he doing? He's liking Gehenna to the city dump 
where they threw all of the, they didn't have sophisticated sewer systems like we have today, where they threw all of the refuse, they threw all of the feces, they threw all of the trash, and all of the mess on the dump, and they set the dump on fire, and the maggots and the fire burned in the dump. Jesus said, that's what hell will be like. It'll be like Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, a wicked place that the smoke of the torment will ascend up forever. And the people who are there, they will never cease to be. They will never not exist. And they will never not be tormented. What is your point, preacher? I'm glad you asked. In Revelation 20 and 13, where I just read to you where death and Hades will give up the give up the dead that are in them. Verse 14 said, death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible says this is the second death. Well, the lake of fire is Gehenna. It's that hell that lasts forever. So it's bad to leave here and you've never been saved because if you're not saved when you die you do not go to a place of rest you go to a place where you will be like the rich man tormented in the flame you will not cease to exist you will be tormented in the flame until the day of judgment and they will take you out of Hades and put you in Gehenna, the lake of fire, and you will burn there forever and ever. But if you leave here and you've been born again, you go from earth to the bosom of Abraham, that part of Hades, and you wait there in your blessed state until the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Rise from where? From the bosom of Abraham. And we're gonna be called up to meet the Lord in the middle of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. And I'm on my way to a place of blessedness. And I'm going to leave there. And I'm going to a place where God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more dying. One day in God's kingdom will be worth it all. This is eternal life. This is life eternal. Not just living forever, but living forever with the Lord. Living forever with Jesus in a new body. Say yeah. Say yeah. Don't you want to go? Don't you want to go? Don't you want to go? This is God's truth. God's truth. The truth is the Father have given Jesus authority to give life eternal to everybody that will accept him. What's the point? You can't get it from anywhere else. The only ticket that will keep you out of the torment of Hades and the lake of fire is to accept Jesus. That's God's truth. Nothing else matters. 
Oh, I want to tell Oprah. Nothing else matters. Bill Harpo Studios. Become a billionaire. Win all of the championships. Famous athlete. Sell all of the records, entertainer. But if you don't know Jesus, if you don't give your heart to the Lord, if you don't get saved, no matter how peaceful your corpse may appear, because mortuary science is something else, they can make a devil look like a saint laying there looking at rest and oh, so peaceful. But if you don't know Jesus, according to God's truth, you're not at rest. You're not at rest. No matter how peaceful he or she may appear to be, they're tormented in the flame. In the flame. In the flame. Begging for somebody to dip their finger in some water to cool their tongue. And nobody will come. Well, how long will they be there? Until Jesus comes. Until the final judgment. Then only. And, and see, if you're in that place, the judgment is almost a formality. Because if you, it, 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 there's no uh, Catholics, there's no purgatory. You, you can't get there and work your way up. You can, you, there's no repentance. After death, you can't, you can't, well, will you, I, is, is, is it possible for me to, if I end up in Hades, can I get saved while I'm in Hades and, 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 and the Lord saved me and I avoid the lake of fire? No. No. When you leave here and you don't know Jesus, things go from bad. <laughs> the, the greatest understatement in the world, from bad to worse. Because when you stand in that judgment, then you're emptied into the lake of fire. But the point, I was, point I'm making, I don't want this, to get, this point to get lost. You're still existing. So when I said that life eternal is more than existing, that's the point I'm trying to make. We're going to do, you don't want to live forever. If you end up in hell. Amen. If you end up in, a, in the lake of fire. You, it, you, you, will, you will hope. You want to die. And you can't. And you know what it's called. It's interesting. It's interesting. It is called. It is called. The second death. But it doesn't mean annihilation. It doesn't mean non-existence. It's death forever. Death forever by definition. It's torment forever. And there will be no presence of God. No salvation. No holiness. No preacher to preach. No kind words. No fresh air. Nothing nice. No quietness. No beautiful music. No melodies. Nothing. And... It will never end. On the other hand, we'll be singing over you. And we'll be singing over there. With the Lord. This is what Jesus was talking about. When he says, Father, you have given me the power to give eternal life. To every man. I have a question for you. Who are streaming and who are here in the sanctuary. Is there any person or anybody truly worth going to hell over? Is there any person or anybody or anything worth even risking? Risking your life for. You mean tell me the liquor is that good? The drugs are that powerful that you would trade forever for it in this temporary sojourn. 
And life is so temporary. So I do this for a living. So funerals and stuff is part of our everyday thing. Life is so temporary. Mother, we almost had to kind of restrict what member, the, the level of kin, because people are dying so much that you can be announcing they almost do that somebody dead every Sunday. So I said, we can't go all the way down to third cousin and all that because it's like a necrology every Sunday. But somebody's going here all the time. It reminds us all that this thing is transitory. Nobody's here to stay. But when you leave here, there ain't, there, there ain't but uh, uh, one option. You either going to... Two, there's, a, there's two places. You will end up either in the bosom of Abraham or tormented in the flame. If you end up in the bosom of Abraham, when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ going to rise first. We who are alive and remain going to be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the middle of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a future. What a future. What a future. What a future. And do you not know, do you not know that, now it's safe to say, it's safe to say from the deduction of scripture, it's safe to say, I don't think I would be stretching it, Dr. Foster, you let me know if I'm stretching, that Lazarus and the rich man, it will be safe to say, lived during the time of Abraham, since they knew him, recognized him, seemed to have a degree of familiarity with him. Matter of fact, he, re he referred to him respectfully, Father Abraham. So it's fair to, de to deduct that they were Jews, lived during Abraham's time, was well, my point. Now, we don't know how old that poor beggar was. Okay? They probably outlived Abraham. Abraham was there when they got there. The name of the place was the bosom of Abraham. Okay? So then... Since Abraham's time up until now, the poor man has been in a place of conscious blessedness, enjoying the goodness of the Lord, awaiting a glorified body and the resurrection, waiting to hear the trump of God. And uh, uh, he, I, I, tell, I tell you the truth, he almost jumped the gun one day. Because there was another dead man named Lazarus. <laughs> Centuries, a few hundreds of years later, Mary and Martha's brother. He died. And then Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And uh, this Lazarus, Abba, they said, wait a minute. He's not talking to you. He had to go back and go on back to celebrate and enjoy. Said, ain't your turn yet. Said, I'll come back and get you. But I got to get this one, and, and this one that I'm calling now, don't worry, he'll be back soon too. So when Lazarus came back after he finally died to stay dead till Jesus come, both Lazarus probably talked. Hey, man, what was it like up there? He said, man, I'm glad to be back down here. <laughs> said, Praise the Lord. He said, here we got all the goodness of the Lord, and both of us are glad that we're not over there. And yet from that time until this time, that rich man, been tormented in the flame, burning. And you know what he can't do? 
He can't not exist. He can't die. My, that's back to my opening. Eternal life is more than living forever. Eternal life is living forever in the presence of the Lord. For if you're not in God's presence, you don't want to live forever. You would much rather not exist, be annihilated. But in my closing, and this is it, the only thing is we have no say in that. You have no say. We can kill each other's bodies, but the only person who can kill our spirits, our soul in hell, and that death is called the second death, is God. So you can, you can, you can take a person's life, but you can't stop that individual from existing. We have no say in that. So since you're going to live forever, since you're going to exist from now on, since you will never not exist, then why not make sure that that existence, whether in the earth realm or in the world to come, is with the God of the Bible in his blessed state. I want to pray for someone. There's someone here today who says, Preacher, I want to make sure. I want to be saved. I'm, I didn't know some of the things I learned today. I didn't know that I would always exist somewhere. And I didn't know that the only way I'll get rest is to know Jesus Christ. If you're here and you want the Lord and you want this, come and we will pray for you. And the Lord will save your soul. I'm not opening the altar right now to pray for the healing of the sick. I already anointed people with the anointing for God's truth for the new year. So we ain't going to do that again. Praise the Lord. So some folk try to fix it, you know. If you going to be somewhere else where you choose to be, that, that, that don't give me no obligation to be doing it three weeks later. The point is, you have to be here when it happens. That's your call. And you, you make the decision. Say amen. So that way you don't cheapen it. So my mama wanted me with them, so I was with mama and them. Okay, well, you can be with them, but you can't do that and do this. Some things are worth the sacrifice, or it's not worth it. But don't try to get me to do it again. Uh, it wore me out. See, man, it took, me, it took me two days to recuperate. I want to be saved. Come to Jesus. Here comes a soul. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to make sure that if I die today, if I left here right now, I would go to the bosom of Abraham awaiting the Lord's resurrection. I want to go where Jesus is. Come. There are young graves. There are old graves. You can go to any morgue. Morgues are not overpopulated with the bodies of elderly people. There's all kinds of folk. Male, female, white, black, young, and old lying up in there. They make no noise. They can't move. But their spirits, that breath of life that was breathed in them is either in the bosom of Abraham 
or tormented in the flame. Glory to God. Let us pray for this soul as she's coming to know Jesus Christ. Oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Save her, Lord. Save right now. Save right now. Isn't it amazing the number of people who will tell you they want to get saved till it's time to get saved? Waste your time. Interfere with you. Call you. And then when it's time, it won't do right. The, you're going to let the devil cause you to miss what God has for you. Hallelujah. Because I ain't going to put up with that. Call you, take up all your time. Then when it's time, won't come. Praise the Lord. Let the Lord save you. Let the Lord touch you. There may be somebody in a backsliding condition. Preacher, if I left here right now, I'm not sure where I will be. You better come. You better come. You need to come. You will never not exist. You will never not exist. Mama is somewhere. Daddy is somewhere. They exist. I was at a funeral yesterday. The spirit of the deceased is somewhere. No one is annihilated. That's why life is such a precious gift. God did something when he let you get Gave you life. He said, now, you're going to live forever. Your mom, you're going to live forever. Your loved ones, mine, you're going to live forever. You're going to exist forever. You will either exist in the second death or you will exist with life eternal. I'm glad that I have eternal life. And the good news is, since I know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, my eternal life has already begun. It don't start when you die. According to the definition Jesus gives, it starts when you get to know Jesus. Isn't that something? The day you got, got saved and accepted Jesus as your Savior. Young lady, Hallelujah. Did you give your heart to Jesus today? Do you believe the Lord saved you? Hallelujah. Somebody praise the Lord for this young lady, for this soul, for this soul. Thank you for saving me, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Somebody praise the Lord for this soul. There's rejoicing in heaven. There's more rejoicing over the one soul than 99 that need no repentance. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Stay with the Lord, my sister. Serve him with your whole heart. Amen. Life now is sweet. And my joy is complete. Because I'm saved. 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 Life now is sweet. And my joy is complete. For I'm saved, saved, saved.